This is a test recording. Please adjust the sound volume so that you can hear my voice clearly in the entire room. Welcome to Recognizing Beneficial Insects in the Landscape, presented by Airfon Vafai, Extension Program Specialist in IPM at Texas A&M AgriLife Extension. This is a disclaimer. This presentation is a recording. Although the speaker will try to get you to interact with him periodically, please remember, he is just trying to trick you, because this is just a pre-recording. Thank you. Oh, hi there. Sorry I didn't see y'all. Uh, so nice to have y'all here with me today. Um, gosh, uh, if you have any kids, uh, as do I, this is a great book. Uh, it goes through the entire alphabet and uh, gives you an insect for each. So I have just learned everything I need to know for this presentation in this book. Okay, that's not entirely true, but uh, sorry for not being able to be there with you today. If y'all were uh, in my pollinator talk earlier uh, this morning, then you're probably already familiar a little bit with my video format here. I like to pretend like I'm there in person, even though I am not. So um, thank you so much for joining me today. We're going to talk about recognizing beneficial insects in the landscape. And really, we're going to look at uh, some beneficial versus not so beneficial insects and how to distinguish between the two. Uh, so that hopefully you're feeling a little bit more confident about identifying insects in your garden. Now, I must give you a disclaimer. It is not possible within an hour to go through all of the potential pests you may encounter and to really make you confident in identification. That, that can take a little while. I am still uh, learning a lot of ID every year. I learned about some new insects I did not know about because they are incredibly diverse, as we're about to see here in a moment. <clears throat> So first and foremost, you know, if there's one takeaway I want you to get from this presentation is that we are in the presence of many aliens within your backyard, when you're walking on the sidewalk and there's turf nearby or even on the pavement itself. At all times, there's some mini battle going on with these little aliens just fighting each other. Pew, 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 pew. Right. And so they're they're incredibly diverse in their morphology, the way they look, their behavior, their physiology. Uh, and, and the way that they actually live and persist. And so it's actually kind of mind-blowing. So I, I love showing this little uh, piece of this photo here to people and asking, you know, what do they think it is? And uh, are there any guesses what this might be? Any guesses? Anyone? Just raise your hand. Okay, I just want to remind you, this is a pre-recorded video. So if you just raised your hand, I am sorry for any embarrassment I may have caused. This here is actually a piece of a spider, Microthena gracilis. As you can see, it has a very strange morphology. Uh, it, it almost doesn't make sense as to why it looked like that. Some people think it's, you know, was that a slug or was it some kind of crustacean? Uh, because it, it resembles those in some ways. You know, we have these other very interesting, crazy behaviors, such as lacewing larva. Uh, this is a, a type of an immature of an insect that will actually pile on dirt and debris on its back as a way of disguising itself. Uh, and it is a voracious predator. It will seek out other uh, soft-bodied insects and eat their faces off. We also have very interesting ways in which they develop and grow. So uh, we have what's referred to as an endoskeleton. At least I hope most of us in this room do. That means our skeleton is on the inside of our bodies. So if there's any of you uh, that is on the outside, there's a bit of a problem, right? Whereas with insects, their skeleton's on the outside. It's known as an exoskeleton. And so as you can imagine, you know, they have this rigid structure on the outside. They can only grow so much until they actually need to cast off and, and you know, break out of that skeleton. And then uh, they have a new soft exoskeleton developing as they grow a little bit. And then it hardens again. So if, you ever, uh, if you're familiar with lobsters, they kind of do a similar type of thing. Right? And so this is a very foreign uh, concept for us humans because that's not the way we develop or, or any of the other common animals that we see running around trotting in a forest. 
And we have this very interesting, uh, some insects look like uh, kind of a mad scientist combination of two other organisms. So in this case, we have a cricket that uh, has hands that look like a mole. It's referred to as a, as a mole cricket. And its hands are uh, specially designed to be able to dig holes and trenches. And anyone who's worked in turf or has a golf course or anything like that has probably dealt with these and really annoyed with them because they cause very similar damage to moles. Now, they're also considered predators. You'll see in the background there a caterpillar that is kind of like mauled away a little bit. You can see right there this dark spot is where it's kind of chewed up. And, uh, and then it's come to the foreground for a nice little photograph. We have, again, crazy fusions of insects. This is called a, a mantid fly, right, where the rear end of this segment here looks a lot like a lacewing, if you're familiar with lacewings at all. And this front half here looks a lot like a praying mantis. So, again, it's this interesting fusion of, of different types of organisms. <clears throat> Oh, and speaking of very interesting behaviors, you know, again, uh, we're going to see something that resembles very much the fictional movie Alien. And I like to think that a lot of these fiction sci-fi movies get their ideas from insects because anytime you see something that looks just absolutely crazy or unimaginable, uh, there is an insect that does something like that. Case in point, we have this, uh, what's referred to as an antlion. And uh, this insect here uh, lives in little burrows. It actually makes a little trench in the ground. You can see here, it's a little divot. And essentially any insect that walks around it, near it, or on top of it, it'll start shooting dirt at it. Uh, basically just spitting dirt at it to, to try and get it to fall down into the hole. And I'll grab it and pull it down into the hole and eat it. It's not unlike Sarlacc from Star Wars that ate Bubba Fett. If anyone remembers that thing, that was just this little hole and just sucking things down. Mind you, antlions don't have these tentacles, right? And it's not, I mean, Sarlacc, I think, was classified as some type of a plant, perhaps. I'm not sure. But, uh, you know, it's a similar type of concept that it's this little trench that's just a death trap. So these mini aliens are incredibly diverse. So again, like I mentioned at the beginning, you know, in this one hour, we can't cover it all. Definitely not. You know, if you ever have a chance to go to the Texas A&M uh, Insect Museum, they have over 2.9 million specimens of insects. And so they're just cabinets and cabinets of cabinets. And you just pull it in every single drawer has another whole, uh, you know, group of organisms that you've perhaps never seen before. And it's an absolute spectacle. Now, the recent estimates of species diversity on the planet, not of just insects, but of all organisms, is about 8.7 million. 80% of existing species are thought to be undescribed. That is to say, we haven't even discovered more than half, you know, we haven't even discovered, you know, 86% of the insects, the organisms, sorry, all organisms that are on our planet. And of that organism diversity, insects are about 59%. So insects are one of the most, or are the most diverse group of organisms currently on the planet. And so first and foremost, the thing I want to, to, to say here to all of you is that misidentification is not your fault. All right, so turn to the person to your left, turn the person to your right, and tell them it's not your fault. Thank you for doing so. Uh, so, you know, it, again, it's very challenging because of all this diversity. Not only that, but to confound it and make it even more difficult is this concept of mimicry. This is the idea where one animal will resemble another. So the resemblance can be in color, pattern, form, or behavior. And sometimes the mimic will involve uh, only some part or aspect of another animal. So some examples of types of mimicry include Batesian. So this is where an organism will mimic a less pal palatable species. So for example, the less palatable species in this system is the monarch butterfly. Their uh, larva will uh, feed on milkweed plants. Milkweed plants have a, oops, sorry. <laughs> milkweed plants have a very specific toxin that they will sequester. They will basically eat it and they'll accumulate it so that if a bird eats it, Mm, it's not very pleasant, not something uh, that they want to eat. So it makes them uh, not very palatable to predators. Now, there's another organism, the viceroy uh, butterfly, that does not 
feed on milkweed at all as caterpillars. And they are actually quite palatable. But you'll notice that it looks a lot like a monarch butterfly. It almost looks identical. And so the reason why it looks like that is it's thought that it's mimicking this less palatable species. So if a bird has eaten a monarch butterfly, whoo, that was a bad night, not doing that again. Well, it sees a viceroy butterfly and it's going to think, uh-uh, I've had one of those before and I'm not going to eat that again. Little does it know that the viceroy butterfly is actually uh, quite delicious, actually, quite delicious. Don't recommend it. I have not eaten one myself. Uh, we also have Mullerian mimicry, and this is when unpalatable species mimic each other. The idea here is that by mimicking each other, uh, you get uh, predators that will learn much quicker uh, what they shouldn't eat and what they should not mess with. So you have honeybees, bumblebees, and wasps right? that have this uh, striped yellow and black, and all of them are equally non-palatable and have a, a pretty nasty sting. So if you have ever messed with a yellow jacket, or yellow jacket has messed with you, I should say, uh, you have learned very quickly, and you probably are afraid of anything that is black and yellow, even if it's not a yellow jacket wasp. Uh, which is not necessarily a bad idea because some of these other things, if you mess with them, if you disturb them, uh, they, they can become a little bit painful. So um, that's what uh, Mullerian mimicry is. Now, self-mimicry is when one body part mimics another body part. So here, as an example, uh, we have this uh, caterpillar where its rear end actually looks like a face, right? So uh, by looking like a face, if a predator starts to approach it, thinking that it wants to approach it from the rear so it's undetected, all of a sudden it's kind of confused. It doesn't know where and how to approach it. So uh, very quickly it uh, just decides to perhaps feed on something else. So the question now is, you know, with this, all this type of mimicry and all this diversity, how can we know which is good, right? So which one can we know is the evil one and which one is the good one? And first and foremost, I want to start by saying there's no such thing as a bad or an evil insect, right? It's just the choices they make, right? They can all make good choices. It's just they make, they make poor decisions, and so they need to be reprimanded, perhaps. Uh, so we're going to look at some of these insects that um, need to be reprimanded. So I want to, I'm going to first go through the, you know, those two main uh, types of development in insects. Okay, on the left side here, you'll see what's referred to as incomplete metamorphosis. We have uh, insects that they'll lay these eggs, the eggs will become nymphs, and then those nymphs become adults. And they go through different stages of nymphs, and uh, the nymph stage basically resembles the adult. So it looks a lot like the adult, but it doesn't have wings, it might be slightly different color, so on and so forth. But you'll notice the general shape is, is like the adult. On the right side, we see what's referred to as complete metamorphosis. So you get eggs that become larvae, go through different larval stages, and they have a pupil stage. So now it's metamorphosing completely in shape and form and becomes an adult. So you'll notice the larval stages look very different from the adults. And the reason why I'm bringing this up is because uh, oftentimes what we see in the garden are these larval stages. And it helps to be able to identify what type of adult that larva would become. And uh, that gives us a better idea of whether that is a insect that will make good choices in life or an insect that will make bad choices and needs to be reprimanded. So I love this. Uh, it's referred to as a dichotomous key, right? So you, you start at one spot and it's, you know, you either go left or right, left or right, until you eventually you end up at your end point. You have an idea of what you have. This dichotomous key here, uh, it can be found through the University of Kentucky College of Agriculture. And you start here at the very top. So if your uh, larva has three pairs of segmented legs on the thorax, you go left. If it has no segmented legs on the thorax, go to section two. We'll go to section two a little bit later here. <clears throat> Pardon me. So if we go here to the left, now we'll see it, it says it has Paired fleshy legs present on abdomen, you go left. It has no fleshy legs on abdomen, you go right. So let's say we have the fleshy legs. Again, we'll go through what some of these are. You'll see these segmented legs are the ones here in the front. And this is considered the thorax up here. This is the head, this is the thorax, abdomen is down here. You'll notice these additional legs. Anyone who's studied entomology before knows that 
uh, that the insects are in this group, no, group known as hexapods. Hexa being six, poda being legs. So all insects have six legs. So they have three pairs up here, which means six, but what are these legs down here? So these are considered fleshy legs, pseudo legs. They're not, they're not jointed uh, legs like these ones in the front. Now from here, it has five or fewer pairs of fleshy legs. We are dealing either with, whoops, sorry, a caterpillar, loopers, or inchworms. All of these are chewing insects uh, that can be considered pests if they are in high enough numbers uh, that the damage is considered undesirable. So as an example here, we have an IO moth caterpillar. Okay, so here's the head uh, on the right side, and then we have the three pairs of jointed uh, or segmented legs. And then if we go to the abdomen, we can see at least three pairs, if not four pairs of fleshy legs. So it is less than five. Uh, so this is a type of a caterpillar. Now, if we go on over to the right, more than five pairs of fleshy legs. So that means six or more. So here's a one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight on this one. These are sawflies, and these are actually the larval stage of some types of wasps. And these wasps, their larval stage is actually a chewing insect, very similar to caterpillars of moths and butterflies. They can be considered a chewing insect pest. So here, you can see these beautiful caterpillars uh, posing very beautifully for the photographer, and boom, we see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, if not eight, pairs of fleshy legs. So yes, these are sawflies, and you can see they've peeled back, pretending like they didn't cause us chewing damage, but it was them. It was. They're making poor choices. All right, so now going on back. All right, so that's if they have any fleshy legs. If they do not have any fleshy legs, right, so they still have these segmented legs in the front, uh, but they have no fleshy legs. So now we're going over to this side. If those uh, jointed legs are long thoracic legs, then we have lacewing, lady beetle, or ground beetles. These are all considered predators. They're considered beneficial insects. Now, if you think about it this way, a predator is hunting. Right? In order to hunt, you need to be able to travel faster than your prey. So these long legs assist them to catch up to their prey and to eat them. And so uh, if they have those long legs, again, predators. So here is an example. Here is that uh, long uh, thoracic legs. You'll see no uh, fleshy legs here on the rear. This is a lady beetle larva. So, or often people will call them ladybugs. They're technically beetles. So an entomologist would uh, call it a, a lady beetle. Their larva are, look very much like this. They, they have these legs, uh, just three pairs of long legs in the front. This is a ground beetle larva. And as you can tell from its uh, front mandibles here, it is also an excellent predator, both in its larval stage and adult stage. Again, here you'll see three pairs of long jointed legs. Now, if we go to the right side, the short thoracic legs, we're dealing with white grubs, wireworms, rootworm, leaf beetle, or carpet beetles. All of these insects are considered pests. They are chewing plant material. They're, they're, they are herbivores. So here's an example of white grubs. You can see, again, no fleshy legs, and they have what's considered relatively shorter uh, front legs. We also have here the tobacco wireworm, which can be feeding on the roots. You can see tiny little front jointed legs. All right, so now that covered this section one, which was if basically there are any sign of legs. Now, if you, there's no segmented legs on thorax, go to section numero dos. All right, so number two. Uh, here now, you're going either left or you're going right. So if we go to the left, if it has a distinct head, you're, de you're dealing most likely, now there are exceptions to all of this. This is a general, pretty good general rule. If it has a distinct head, we're dealing with weevil grub, a midge, mosquito, drain fly, fungus gnat, or soldier fly. Now most of these are also considered pests. The soldier fly is considered uh, great in compost. Uh, so it is not, depending on the context, usually is not considered a, a major pest, but a lot of these others are considered either a nuisance, agricultural, or a human pest, such as the mosquito. 
So here we can see the dark winged fungus gnat larva, Bredesia. So here's the head that's quite dark. And if you uh, leave your, your soil uh, too moist for a long period of time, these fungus gnats, as the name suggests, will lay their eggs in that wet soil and those larvae will feed on that fungus. But if you have a high abundance of this larva, they can start feeding on plant roots as well. We have weevil larva, considered a pest. We have a type of, uh, of, of weevil that uh, is a quarantinable pest on citrus, uh, the diaprepes root weevil. So they can become incredibly damaging. Uh, this one is called the pitch-eating weevil. You can see here, it looks like it has zero legs, no legs. Now, if we go on the right side, whoops, sorry. Now on the right side, the head is mostly hidden or no distinct head. So now you got no legs and no distinct head. We are dealing either with a crane fly, rat tailed maggot, flat headed boar, round headed boar, maggot, or aphid predator. As you may tell from the name, the only one that's really considered beneficial in this group is the aphid predator. All right, so that one's feeding on aphids, as the name suggests. So we have here, for example, the house fly, right? So there's no distinct head, right? There is a distinct uh, kind of, you know, top and a broad, bottom or front and a back, uh, but you can't really see a darkened head or distinct features of a head. These here are their pupa, all right? So they're becoming adults. Here as well, we have the crane fly larva, which again, the head does not have any kind of distinct coloration. All right, so now something to keep in mind, right, whenever we're dealing with cal caterpillars, uh, as I always tell people, you know, they are considered a very uh, controversial pest, right? If you're on my pollinators talk, again, controversial pest, uh, because in their adult stage, we consider them beautiful, right? Oh, everyone's like, man, this thing's amazing. Hawk moth, it's a sphinx moth. It's a lot like a hummingbird, right? Like hovers in front of the flower. Its wing beats are as quick as a hummingbird. They, they'll even zoom past you like a humming, hummingbird and it sounds just like one. But you look at the larval stage, okay? It's actually a type of a hornworm. So yes, they eat all of the things. They chew a whole lot. So uh, it really depends. You want a good balance between letting the caterpillars chew some plants so you can have the beautiful butterflies and moths and also making sure they're not eating your entire crop. Now we have some that can also look very dangerous, look very menacing, right? So in this case, like, yeah, I know, I look mean, right? It's got all these spines on it and the spines have baby spines coming off them. Uh, so it looks pretty freaky. <clears throat> Pardon me. Uh, but this is actually the caterpillar of the Gulf fritillary. So anyone who's ever had any uh, passion flowers or passion plants, uh, absolutely gorgeous plant, gorgeous flowers. And uh, the immatures, the caterpillars, will feed on those plants. Uh, so again, although a uh, scary looking caterpillar looks like you need to do something to control it, it can actually be uh, not that bad and, and, and quite beneficial to have around. We have a number of wasps, okay? Things that look like wasps in the garden. In this case, what you see, it looks like a wasp, but it is not. This is actually a type of a clear wing moth. And it's called that because it's a moth that has wings that are clear. So if you think of wasps, right? Wasps always have clear wings, but moths for the, for the most part have scales on them that are you know, white or brown or some type of color. It's opaque, you can't see through it. This, these types of moths are special in that uh, their wings are actually clear, just like wasps. Uh, now, many, many species are considered important wood boring pests, uh, like we do have um, some, some wood boring pests of a lot of tree orchards that are clear wing moths that are considered major pests. In a home garden, for the most part, uh, there aren't too many clear wing moths that are considered that detrimental. Uh, now this, a lot of people might think, oh, this is a yellow jacket. Oh no, it's horrible. Do something about it. But really, uh, yeah, no, this is, this is a yellow jacket. Yeah, this is a very, very angry wasp. Uh, they're just always angry, so uh, you want to be careful with them. They are uh, rather aggressive. Uh, that doesn't mean that you need to kill them on sight, but if you do have a nest around the home, um, I mean, my recommended strategy is to manage them, especially if you have young children around. But now, boom, you got this one. Looks a lot like a yellow jacket, but it's not. What could it be? It's an American hornet moth, 
or poplar clear wing borer. Now, as the name suggests, again, so this is a clear wing moth, and you'll notice those antennae are very plumous, they're very thick and quite hairy. Okay, here on the left side, it's even hairier, sorry, it's a bit out of focus on the left side, but the hairier the antennae uh, is actually a male. So the male uses those hairs on the antennae to be able to pick up uh, chemicals to be able to detect where the females are at, right? So you gotta know where, where the female's at so they can mate and, and lay eggs. Uh, that's that's some of the action you're seeing here, uh, and so those those clear wings um, again look like a wasp, but actually a type of a moth. And as the name suggests, poplar clear wing borer. If you have poplar trees, they may be uh, boring into that poplar and causing damage to the tree in that way. Uh, but they are not a stinging insect pest, right? So moths do not have stingers. And we have a number of insects that fall under the group of being waxy, right? So they exude this type of like white wax. So we have uh, insects like mealybugs, which are considered a sucking insect pest. And they're sucking that plant sap so they can weaken it in that way. Uh, but they can also excrete a sugary solution known as honeydew. And that honeydew basically makes the leaf surface sticky and serves as an inoculum for sooty mold. It's a concoction or a mixture of different types of fungus that uh, makes it kind of look black like soot, which doesn't directly hurt the plant, but it basically reduces the plant's ability to absorb the rays of the sun. So uh, they can be damaging in that way. Mealybugs are not super mobile. They don't move very quickly or fast. They're typically relatively still. So that's one way of knowing if you're dealing with uh, mealybugs or we'll see here in a moment, uh, scale insects as well. So here's an example of pink hibiscus mealybug. Now, this is one way they can look, or they can look like this, right? So this is also pink hibiscus mealybug a little bit closer. You can see a little bit less uh, waxiness. There's still quite a bit of wax, but it's not like they're, they're quite as covered as you can see here on the left side. But so there is some variation, even within species, depending on where they are in their development. We also have the crepe myrtle bark scale. So anyone, quick show of hands, who has crepe myrtles? All right, just a reminder, this is a pre-recorded video. All right, so if you just raise your hand, I do apologize, um, but I can't see it. So um, anyways, if you have crepe myrtles, there's a good chance, especially here in the east, uh, you know, North Texas region, uh, that you have this crepe myrtle bark scale on there. That's these white spots that you'll see, and it's a scale insect pest. So scales and mealybugs are very similar in many ways, uh, and they have this white uh, waxiness. Again, they're not moving around a whole lot. And this particular scale, those white spots are the adults. So either uh, the large round ones, it, it has a female inside that sack uh, that's gonna lay all of her eggs and she dies in there, or the smaller, more oblong ones, like there and here, those are actually male pupa. So the male will, will create this little case around him and uh, metamorphose into a winged male. Uh, so there's that little distinction. Here's the winged male coming out of a male pupa there under a, uh, a microscope. And then we have different species of scale, of course, that have different levels of, let's say, a waxiness. So we have the false oleander scale as an example. Now here, some people might think, well, is this a scale, right? But you'll notice that motion, all right? Look at this insect moving to the opposite side of my finger. Now, if you remember, I said mealybugs are not very mobile. Scale insects, especially those adults, do not move at all, okay? And, and scale insects in general are not that mobile either. This is actually a type of a plant hopper, all right? So these are also sucking insect pests. Uh, but it's, it's a, a different category of sucking insect pests. You can see those their distinct legs right there. All right, so this is actually the citrus flatted plant hopper, and these are the nymphs. Only the nymphs exude that wax. The adults do not. Now, a uh, very similar uh, species, a little bit more closely related than, say, scale, are the glassy-winged sharpshooters. Okay, aptly named because you can see that honeydew shooting off, and that's the sugary solution, the sap. And you'll notice, boom, as soon as you tap the plant, they go on the opposite end of the stem. All right, so this is a behavior that's relatively distinct to plant hoppers and leaf hoppers, where they will try to avoid contact uh, with a larger organism. Uh, kind of a wise idea, if you ask me. 
But again, so if something is moving very quickly like that around the stem, you're not dealing, and it's waxy, you're not dealing with a scale insect or a mealybug, there's a good chance you're dealing with some kind of a plant hopper. Ah, they're kind of fun to watch, aren't they? <laughs> whoop, 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 whoop. <laughs> All right. All right, so here's another waxy insect, right? And this one's already on the move, okay? I haven't disturbed it. So it's moving quite quickly, so it's not going to be a mealybug, and it's not going to be a scale. So what might it be? Now, this is actually a type of a predator. All right, if something's moving around this quickly, uh, there's a good chance it's hunting, okay? And in this case, it's actually a, a type of a lady beetle larva. So this one species, I'm sorry, let's go back. There's this one species, um, well, actually, there's a few species that will feed on scale insects on crepe myrtles, and that their larvae look a lot like this. And the adults actually have these, uh, they're black with red spots on them. So again, if it's moving relatively quickly, you can see large jointed legs on the front. So these are uh, lady beetle larvae, like we saw before. They don't have any of the fleshy legs, but they do have long jointed legs in the front if you were to flip it upside down. And also, the hackberry woolly aphid is kind of waxy. All right, and this, uh, I think it was like two or three summers ago in East Texas, we had this stuff, it felt like it was like snowing in the middle of the summer with this stuff. Uh, but it was actually just a massive kind of exodus movement of the hackberry woolly aphid. And you could put your hand out and it would, it would, it would you know, fall on there. And uh, you'll be able to see distinct wings. All right, so the hackberry woolly aphid does have wings, legs, and, and antennae. So here's a closer shot. Uh, this is how you can know if it's an aphid. Again, they hold their wings uh, kind of up, uh, up and flat, and uh, they do have very long uh, uh, three pairs of distinct legs. They're not a predator, though. They are uh, a pest. This is not a larva, right? So if this was a larva, then you could maybe guess that it's a predator. But in this case, this is actually an adult of an insect that undergoes incomplete metamorphosis. So they have nymphs and an adult. Uh, so this here is a, a hackberry woolly aphid. And we also have, in terms of waxy insects, if you're looking at uh, hemlock, you have a hemlock woolly adalgid. And this has wreaked havoc on a lot of the hemlock. Uh, if you've been to the Carolinas, they have uh, tree signs uh, out in the forest of you know trials and work being done to try and manage the hemlock woolly adalgid. We also have a number of organisms that look very honeybee-like. So here's a photo of a honeybee, what we often associate with being a honeybee. But we look in this next little video here, it looks like a honeybee, but this is actually a type of a fly, known as a surfeit fly or a hover fly. Again, anyone who listened to my pollinator talk earlier today uh, would have seen this. Uh, it's you know feeling on uh, feeding on pollen and nectar. And what they do is uh, they lay their eggs near soft-bodied insects, such as aphids, and uh, they will eat those aphids alive. So here is a surfeit fly larva that has grasped an aphid. You can see it's kind of deflated because it's sucking that aphid dry. And if you will recall, surfeit fly larvae do not have any distinct legs and don't have a distinct head. So although here you can kind of tell because you know this is the part that has the aphid in its mouth, uh, it's hard to see whether it has a distinct head. It's not like the separate kind of entity, right? So uh, aphid hunters or aphid eaters uh, are, are in that category. We have these other organisms known as a bee killer or a robber fly, which looks a lot like a honeybee or looks like a bee, but is actually a type of a fly that will catch bees in the air and eat them. So it is actually considered a bee predator. That doesn't mean you need to control them or kill them. You won't have so many. Well, they have found actually their populations can build around apiaries. Uh, that is where they keep bees. Uh, so they can be problematic, you know, for apiculturalists, but they're not so problematic, you know, just in a, a backyard garden or in the landscape. We also have this bee fly, so also considered a type of a fly, not at all a bee. And uh, the immatures are considered parasitic, so it lays its eggs around other uh, insect uh, eggs, and uh, its larva will eat those uh, eggs or larva in order for it to develop. 
Ah, I'm sorry if this is causing trauma for anyone right now, seeing these leaf-footed, oh, ah, leaf-footed bugs. Let me replay that again, just to induce, re-induce that uh, trauma. Leaf-footed bugs, right? So we have uh, a few different species, right? And they often will stick their proboscis. They have a little uh, needle-like feeding part that goes inside a flower bud or a fruit bud or anything like that. Look at all these other little uh, flying wasps and pollinators and things that are crawling around. Uh, but anyways, by feeding on that, they will reduce yields, reduce flowering, uh, so on and so forth. So considered kind of the bane of any home gardener's and even uh, commercial uh, growers' uh, existence. So some of the common species that we have uh, include Leptoglossus zonatus, Leptoglossus clypealis, and Leptoglossus occidentalis. So you'll notice uh, that these two both, these two species both have this kind of like a white stripe going down their back. This one does not, uh, but these are all pretty common species here. And their immatures uh, look quite different. Their immatures are red and spiny. Uh, and so, you know, that kind of, again, might be a type of uh, mimicry, tell, you know, warding off predators, like, hey, I got this red color. I'm not going to taste very good. Um, and so they, they will bunch up. Now, you see this all of a sudden. You say, well, that looks like a leaf-footed bug immature. But you'll notice here it has another insect in its mouth. So actually, this is a type of a predator. This is known as an assassin bug. And one way you can know is if you see his proboscis, its feeding mouth part, it's actually quite a bit thicker and typically shaped more like a scythe. It kind of it can't fold it directly under its body. It actually uh, you know, curves a little bit more. And because it's just thicker, and it's designed for piercing and sucking uh, insects rather than plants. Now we also have milkweed bugs. So everyone, anyone trying to help out uh, monarch butterflies and has milkweeds has probably faced these at some point. Again, these red uh, sucking insect pests. And here is the adult uh, that again can be problematic, including the nymphs around here. So these are the immature nymphs. Uh, here is a milkweed assassin bug. Now look at the similarity in coloration there, right? The difference again here is the milkweed assassin bug is a little bit narrower. They typically won't cluster quite as much. So the milkweed bug, well, they'll cluster because they're just trying to feed on that plant, whereas the milkweed assassin bug is a hunter. And so it is a solitary hunter looking uh, for, for some insects to feed on. And here it is uh, in its immature form. And look at that proboscis. Look at how it's curved and uh, how it's quite a bit thicker. Uh, and so again, that is a predatory insect. So if you see a proboscis that's more curved and thicker, it's a good chance it's a predator, especially if it's not found in a large cluster. And going back to mimicry, right, you'll notice this thing that looks a lot like a, uh, an ant. All right, it looks a lot like an ant. But if you look closely right here, and you know, I, I, I wish I could retake this photo because that leg is just in line with this proboscis. But this proboscis is curved and thick. And this is actually a type of a sucking insect. So ants have mandibles, like chewing mouth parts. So this is not an ant. It's actually a type of a sucking insect. And it's a type of a predatory sucking insect. So it'll feed on other insects. And it's thought that it mimics an ant because ants will actually protect a lot of soft-bodied insects. And so by mimicking, pretending like you're an ant, the other ants are just like, hey, what's up, man? Like, you know, you, you know you're, you're totally cool. But then that insect is going in and feeding on these soft-bodied insects. And we have a number of different types of small flies. All right, so one example that we've kind of already gone through is a dark-winged fungus gnat. All right, which, uh, again, in large numbers, the larva can be problematic. Uh, here is their dark head. You don't see any distinct legs. Uh, they're particularly problematic in our house recently because when it starts to get cold, we bring in those potted plants, and we think to give them a good watering when we do so. But then they're not growing as much inside. You know, they're, they're, it's kind of a cooler environment, not as much light. Uh, so then all of a sudden, that water isn't taken up. It's just sitting in there, and fungus gnats start to proliferate. Uh, and so one way to manage that problem is to take those plants back outside uh, or to just not overwater. Small flies, we also have 
white flies. So if it's a very small fly, but it's white, it kind of mimics a white, a small, a very small white moth. Uh, these are known as white flies, which are a sucking insect pest. So similar to, similar to the aphids, uh, mealybugs, or scales that we saw earlier, they can produce honeydew and subsequently get sooty mold on some of our plants. So these are considered a pest insect. And this is the adult, and they undergo immature metamorphosis. So here we can see this is actually an older stage nymph. All right, and then these are the pupa before it becomes an adult. Uh, and these, these kind of more clearer ones are known as exuvia. So once they've come out of the pupa, all right, if it comes out as an adult, you, you have this old cast skin left there. And these are known as exuvia. And we also have, you know, Drosophila, uh, also known as fruit flies or vinegar flies. Uh, they're typically just considered a nuisance pest, not typically considered a major problem unless you're dealing with spotted wing Drosophila. And we know that we have this here. Uh, they were introduced through California to the U.S. In, back in 2008. And what's a little bit problematic about them is that if you grow any soft-bodied fruit, uh, their females have this, you'll see this jagged, it's like a saw-like ovipositor. That's the organ she uses to lay eggs. Uh, that she can saw open any small little hole and lay eggs in any soft-bodied fruit just before it's ripe. So by the time uh, you're harvesting and eating it, uh, you are getting some extra protein that you didn't know about. Yay! <laughs> no, uh, but you really don't want, well, it greatly decreases the shelf life and uh, it really makes it, uh, destroys your crop if you're trying to sell it. We also have some other small flies, uh, such as parasitic, ooh, parasitic wasps. Movie alien right here, right? So I promised you earlier uh, that insects are like mini aliens, okay? And there's this constant alien battle going on. Parasitic wasps are a great example of that. Here's a case of a parasitic wasp of aphids. This species here in particular is known as Praeon unicum. It's a wasp of aphids on blueberries. And watch this parasitic wasp kind of measure that aphid out and decide to lay an egg. That egg develops into a larva as that aphid continues to feed and feeds that larva unknowingly until nothing is left but the carcass of the aphid and the pupa under that aphid. So that wasp then metamorphoses into a new, uh, new wasp. So when you see something like this, right? So if you see an aphid that's slightly elevated off the leaf, uh, it doesn't look like it's feeding, it's a little hollow. It can be gold, bronze, black, uh, brown. So depending on the color, is gonna depend on the species that's laying, laid an egg in and or on it. And that wasp will cut a nice little hole and, and emerge. And each wasp can lay you know, 100 to 300 eggs, depending on the wasp, uh, depending on the species. And so they're considered highly beneficial in your garden. So if you see something like this, you see some aphids on your plants, but you also see several what we refer to as aphid mummies, uh, then it might be worth just leaving those aphids alone and keep an eye on those mummies. See if you have an increased uh, quantity of those mummies over time, and maybe those wasps will just uh, clean up the problem for you. There's actually some growers, uh, greenhouse, you know, in contained agricultural type settings that will uh, release these wasps. You can actually purchase and release these wasps to manage aphids. In open field type settings, like in a home garden, it's not only considered non-economic, but not quite as viable. So these wasps may just parasitize some of those aphids and then just fly away. It's better to try and encourage the native populations you have around rather than buying large quantities and releasing. We also have, like we mentioned earlier, lady beetle larvae. So here's a lar you can this, this larva of a lady beetle. You can see how quickly it's running. Here's another one right there. You can see how quickly it's running around on that tree branch, right? So that's, that's the behavior of a hunter, right? Of a predator that's looking for something to eat. In this case, it could be a creep myrtle aphid, or a crepe myrtle bark scale, as it is found on a crepe myrtle. Uh, now, oftentimes, almost every year, I get photos of something like this. And people ask me, you know, what in the world is going on? What is this stuff? 
and it's in a cluster, right? And they're stuck together. They're not moving around. You don't see any distinct legs. So it can't be a predator. What could it be? Well, it's actually the pupal stage of a lady beetle. So remember, uh, lady beetles undergo complete metamorphosis, right? They have, a lar they have egg, a larval stage, a pupal stage, and then adult. And so here, they are going from larval stage to adult. They're actually pupating from one stage to the next. And here's actually the adult lady beetle. So like I had said before, there's this lady beetle species that commonly feeds on the crimp myrtle bark scale that has these two red spots, like they were stabbed twice. Okay, there's actually a species known as the twice stabbed lady beetle that essentially looks just like this. And uh, so they're metamorphosing into a new adult. And then even after they become an adult, these exuvia, again, right? So like the adult has come out, you know, that skin can stay on there for a long time. And I remember actually taking a photo of a series of these, uh, you know, pupa up on a tree branch. It was just perfectly picturesque. I took that photo uh, and I thought it was great. A year later, I came back, saw that same group of pupa. I thought it was you know, I, I thought I hadn't seen it before, so I went to take another picture. And as I was framing the shot, I was thinking, you know, this looks very familiar. So I went back and looked at my photos from the year before, and so I took that exact photo, and those exact same exuvia were still on the tree. Again, they don't hurt the tree. They are uh, basically just the cast skins of lady beetles, which are considered uh, beneficial predators. So here's that uh, pupa, and what's kind of neat is that even though they're metamorphosing, right? It's a ball of soup in there that's changing from larva to adult. They can uh, have very simple kind of behaviors. So if you disturb this pupa, it'll kind of flick its body up in the air. And this is kind of a thought to be a bit of a defense mechanism, a way to, oops, sorry, ward off predators. So if a predator is kind of playing with it and trying to determine to eat it or not, it can just kind of flick up in the air real quick and comes back down to kind of scare off anything trying to eat it. Now, like I mentioned, lady beetles are excellent predators, right? So here you can see a multicolored Asian lady beetle eating some aphids. You'll notice this aphid, let me go back here just a quick second. As soon as this one gets eaten, you'll notice these drops form right on these cornicles. Let me do that again, right? So right at the beginning, you'll notice here, there's nothing at the ends of these uh, cornicles or sometimes known as siphunculi. These are basically chimneys of communication for these aphids. So as soon as that one gets eaten, boom, you see these bulbs? That's actually a chemical uh, that it exudes out of those little chimneys and it goes into the air. These aphids can sense that with their antennae. And what this aphid has just released is known as alarm pheromone. Oh no, why? Right, it's just released alarm pheromone, which basically warns all the other aphids to get out of there. So they can sense this chemical in the air, they know something bad is happening, and they run off. Unfortunately, that aphid was too busy telling the other aphids to run away that it got its face eaten off. Every year I also get uh, photos of these, Sucoptera or bark lice, okay, again, clustering insects on, uh, mainly on uh, hardwoods, okay, they are typically feeding on things like lichen and or fungus, they are not considered detrimental to the tree itself, even though it looks like it because of how they cluster, uh, and what's really interesting about them, so they're known as bark lice or tree cattle, they refer to that because if you disturb them, they start running like a group of cattle, now watch this. This is me poking, poking them with a stick. I highly encourage this if you have the opportunity to do so. And look at them running like a herd of cattle. Get me out of here. Come on, boys. Ooh. Right, so here we go. Yeah, they're starting to form a little pattern. Get us out of here. Very entertaining to watch. I mean, I love just watching this group here. They're just butted up against each other and uh, keep keep kind of pushing a nice little stream. Uh, again, just like a herd of cattle. All right. We've also discussed uh, lace wings briefly before. So lace wings are a type of insect that actually lay their eggs on these single threads. So notice this egg 
on, on a single thread. And it's thought that the reason they do this, and, and they found this out by manipulating the lengths of those threads, and in some cases even completely eliminating the thread, just putting all the eggs directly on a leaf surface. And they found that when you got rid of that thread, uh, whichever one came out first would eat all the other eggs. They would cannibalize like crazy. But the longer that thread was, the less likely they were to cannibalize their siblings. So, you know, the takeaway here is if... Uh, if you're having twins or triplets, maybe put them on these threads and that will reduce the chances of cannibalism. But here are the adults. Uh, you know, they are nocturnal. They'll be attracted to those night lights. And here are the, the larvae, just fierce, uh, soft-bodied insect feeding machines. Here's one with an aphid in its mouth. We also have a uh, beneficial type of housefly, right? So we don't think of houseflies as necessarily being uh, beneficial or something we want around, especially in the house, you know, but there are uh, this, this one particular species known as Cenosia. It's also known as a house, uh, sorry, a hunter fly, which will actually perch up on uh, little ledges. It's very small, okay, smaller than a housefly, really. Uh, almost as, just a bit bigger than, you know, I feel like a, a fruit fly or something like that. It's actually quite small. And they'll perch up on these little ledges, and they have very good sight, and they can see other flying insects and will fly and, and catch them and feed on them. So here is that Cenosia feeding on another fly right there. That is all I have for you all today. Uh, thank you so much for your time. If you have any questions, feel free to email me right there uh, or give me a, a call in my office. If you want any additional information, you can go to my website, sixleggedaggie.com. I'm also on Facebook and Instagram uh, for Six Legged Aggie. So just check me out there. Thank you so much.